haven't found this yet, but just to the left over here, um, just beyond this orange doors. So for this evening, we're going to have 12 different presentations. We'll split them into two groups so that we have a little spot uh, to be able to take a break after the sixth one. Uh, before we get started, because this evening is really about our students, uh, let's say hello to a few folks that have helped them along the way. So if you are an instructor, as part of the Galvanized team, will you please go ahead and stand up? <laughs> here at Galvanize, and I've been guiding G99 for the past three months as they've worked their way through the second half of our program. Jess kind of beat you to the punch on honoring our staff and our instructors, but I want to especially point out Alyssa Ebert. Where are you? Yeah. Alyssa, Alyssa, <laughs> get right here. Alyssa has been with G99 since the very beginning. She has really been a thread that has run through their experience here and helped hold them together in the worst of times and celebrate them in the best of times, like tonight. Um, I want to say a few more words about our staff. Our staff here, really from the instructional staff to the events team to our administrative staff, some of the most hardest, the hardest working and most compassionate people that I've ever been around. We're extremely excited for G99 to present the amazing work that they've produced for their capstone projects and to celebrate them as they come to the end of their galvanized journey. Before I introduce G99 and we start the presentations, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our web development program here at Galvanize. As you've heard, or as you already know, our students spend a full six months working incredibly hard to acquire the skill set to call themselves full stack developers. But what exactly does full stack development mean, you might ask? So in essence, it means that our graduates are capable of developing every aspect of a web or mobile application, from the user interface that you see and interact with on your computer or phone, to the servers and databases that support that application, and even through the process of deploying to the internet so that their apps can be used across the world. When you hear a reference to the front end of the stack, we're referring to essentially what the user sees when they're looking at the application on their device. When we refer to the back end of the stack, on the other hand, we're referring to the database, the servers, um, the parts of the application that support data persistence and data transfer and deliver that data to the front end when needed. So here's kind of a little infographic, if you will, of front end, back end, which would be the server in this graphic, and the database. I've put a few of the technologies or icons for the technologies that our students learn here, but by no means is this all encompassing. And as you'll see in their presentations, they've added a lot more technologies and libraries to their skill set. So, in the end, what does being a full stack developer mean? What does this mean for our graduates? So, getting this kind of exposure to the full stack leads our students to have a very wide breadth of knowledge about all aspects of application development, while leaving room for them to discover the particular technologies that resonate with them most 
so that they can develop their own specialities as well. As a result, our students understand what's happening all across the stack and can pursue a wide range of jobs and careers upon completing the program. The final aspect of the program that I want to mention is our emphasis on learning to learn. Being a developer, especially these days, is about so much more than what languages and technologies you know at any given point in time. It's about being flexible, creative, and willing to step outside your comfort zone in a never-ending, I'm sorry to say it, cycle of self-driven education. Technology changes so rapidly that a developer who cannot keep learning is going to be left behind by the industry. And as such, we focus heavily on teaching our students the skills needed to continue their learning journey well beyond their time at Galvanize. All of this leads to the capstone projects, in which we require our students to develop their own full stack application, incorporating at least one major unfamiliar technology that is completely not a part of their education here at Galvanize. Furthermore, they have only 10 days to develop their apps from scratch, as well as produce the wonderful presentations that you're about to see. It's a nearly impossible task, but each and every one of them tackled it head on, fought through the moments of struggle, and produced fantastic results. Lastly, I want to commend G99 for the incredible culture that they've developed over their time at Galvanize. We strive as a staff to instill a spirit of camaraderie and shared success in every cohort that we teach. Ultimately, though, it's up to the students to embrace our message and to organically grow a culture of their own. I am proud to say that G99 embodies that spirit to a T. They're one of the most tightly knit cohorts that I've seen in over two years at Galvanize, showing genuine care and affection for each other on a daily basis, really on like a moment-to-moment -moment basis with this group. They've truly been a joy to work with, and I am incredibly proud of them. Please join me in giving them a big hand before we start the presentations. here to talk to you about my application, Flow. So I moved to Colorado about three years ago. When I did, I started running and jogging. Do we have any other runners in the house tonight? Yeah, yeah, awesome. So I don't know about you guys, but every time I go running, I have to listen to music. It just makes it that much better. But I've come across this problem, but playlists are kind of dumb. You could set up a static playlist of just your favorite songs, but that's the same every single time you go running. And running is repetitive enough already. It doesn't really need any more. You could shuffle your music, but now it's completely random. The song choice has no chance of reflecting where you are in your workout or how hard you're exerting yourself. And the ultimate problem is that a playlist can measure your performance. It doesn't know how fast you're moving, how hard you're working, and that disrupts one of the main benefits of listening to music in the first place. So the solution to this is music that flows. You download Flow onto your phone, when you start a run, it will detect your moving speed, and then based on that moving speed, it will play appropriate music for how hard you're working, how fast you're moving. And that should give you the extra motivation, inspiration, and maybe even enjoy your workout a little bit more. So I got a quick demo that I want to show you guys. <laughs>
So now a little bit more information about how flow works. You sign in, that takes you to the main long screen. From there, you can access your profile. So any quick stats, any information you need to update before you do it. Let's go back, you can access the user screen. You see there are call, moderate, and intense playlists. And that's how flow actually decides what you should do. So you can see back on the main screen, all you need to do is press run. You can see the speed in meters per second and also the name of the playlist that you're currently dropping into the top. And that is basically how Flow works. I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about the tech I use. OAuth has authentication and authorization. Just make sure that your accounts are all secure as possible when I was messing with them. I use Postgres, Node.js, and Connects for the back end, so my servers, database, that kind of stuff. And for the front end, I use NativeBase, Expo, and View Native. And View Native is really the big, unfamiliar technology for me. Up until this point, I mostly focused on desktop, laptop application. It was 2019, so it was really important for me to be able to develop for a mobile platform as well. Some of the challenges that I faced, just detecting speed. I hoped originally there would be a speed on your accelerometer in your phone you could just pull out and look at, but there's a lot more math involved in So I ultimately decided to go with the geolocation, just like Google Maps uses. The music player, I originally hoped to use Spotify, but it turns out Spotify doesn't like it when you try to pipe the music directly from their app into yours. So that means I had to build my own music player, the functionality, the playlists, everything from scratch. And the last big challenge was really just view native. I've never worked with view before, and it was my first time in a native environment. So those two challenges together, I got twice as good at debugging. <laughs> Some future plans, I like custom speed settings, so whether it's your first time off the couch or you run a marathon every weekend, I want you to still be able to have an authentic experience. I'd like to integrate more platforms, so actually reach out to Spotify, iTunes, and find out what steps I need to take to integrate their platform with mine. Treadmill functionality. So right now, it is based on GPS location, so I need a brand new algorithm, probably something more similar to a Fitbit. And lastly, just run analysis. I want you to be able to know how long, how far, and what type of music really seems to inspire you best. Once again, I'm Bill Bain. I'm a full stack developer, and I'm looking for a job. So stick around and say hi. Thank you. software engineer, and I'd like to talk to you guys a little bit about an app I designed called FitFinder. Now, what is FitFinder? Who here has ordered clothes online that ended up being the wrong size? Okay, I'm a little comforted to know that I'm not alone. <laughs> um, if you're like me, you kind of try to base your decision on which size to order by how it looks on the person wearing it in the picture maybe some generic sizing chart that is sitting right next to it. It doesn't always work out, and let's be realistic, not everybody has a tape measure in their pocket to find out what their actual measurements are and how it relates to the sizing chart. Fitfinder allows you to order clothing online with confidence that when it arrives at your door, it'll be the right size. Now, you might say, Having to return a couple items might not be the worst thing in the world. Maybe, at worst, it's a minor inconvenience. But let's think about the consequences of this on a global scale. Now, in the fashion e-commerce industry, 20 to 30% of their sales end up being returned. And to give you some perspective, that's almost double what brick and mortar retailers experience as far as returns go. Now, incorrect size is the reason for more than half of those online returns. The market itself is a $481 billion industry worldwide. 
Now, when we're talking to numbers of this magnitude, uh, difference in you know one percent change in the amount of returns can make an impact of several billion dollars. Not to mention the positive environmental impact that would come from a major reduction in shipping. So, let's take a look at the finder in action. Now, after I log in, I can save my measurements to my profile page. As I mentioned, I'm not sure anyone really knows these measurements off the top of their head, uh, but the benefit of FitFinder is that once you input them, it remembers your measurements for you. Now, to simplify this in the future, I'll be adding functionality that actually allows you to import data from a 3D body scan and give you more accurate results as well. Uh, from here, you can search for clothes that you like within the app, any item, items that you like, you can add to favorites, and when you click on an item, you can take a closer look. FitFinder will use items available sizing information to recommend the best fit for you. Now, you can return later to view your favorites, and soon I'll be implementing a feature that actually lets you navigate to the seller's webpage and seamlessly complete the transaction. So as far as technologies that I used, on the front end, I built a mobile interface with React Native and Expo. And on the back end, I used Node and Express with Postgres and Connects, and then deployed back end to Heroku. As far as challenges that I faced, uh, React Native was a brand new technology to me. Not only that, but it was my first time building a mobile app. Uh, so becoming competent involved learning different syntax, as well as unfamiliar libraries. And in particular, I found it difficult uh, up front to navigate, to set up the navigation of the app. Now, towards the end of this 10-day sprint that we had, uh, the navigation began to click for me, and now I feel much more comfortable developing in the mobile app space. So I consider that a win. Uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, finding accurate sizing data was also a challenge in building this app. I was able to build a database with sizing information from several different retailers, but as I mentioned, these sizing charts can be very generic. And I'm doubtful that they're 100% accurate for each different piece of clothing. To build on that for planned features moving forward, I'd like to incorporate some new features related to sizing. Uh, the success of this technology is hugely dependent on data in two forms. The first of those is accurate body measurements. And the second piece of that is accurate clothing sizing information. So 3D body scanning is actually an upcoming technology that's becoming more accessible to people like us. I'd like to incorporate data from companies like Naked Labs to improve the ease and accuracy of importing your own body measurements. And then on the clothing side of things, there's a company called TrueFit that's actually accumulating real sizing data that goes beyond just the generic sizing charts that you see on retailers' websites and provides you with valuable, useful information. Uh, these two partners could help ensure that data from both sides of the equation was accurate and effective when you're making a purchase decision. And the last piece is a direct connection to retailer websites from FitFinder. It's a piece of functionality that I'll be implementing uh, very soon here. And it'll allow people to seamlessly purchase the items that they're interested in right from the product page. My name is Rob Hill. If you do have any questions, feel free to approach me afterwards. And I hope you enjoy using FitFinder in the future. Thanks. Join me in welcoming to the stage, Ryan! Hello, everyone. How are you all doing? Good. Yeah. Got to connect real quick. All right. So tonight, I'm going to be presenting my app called Virgio, um, and it's a virtual scavenger hunt app. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, so my app uses this really cool emerging technology called augmented reality. And what augmented reality is, is superimposed um, computer-generated images on top of a user's view of the world. And so, for, for example, my little block with my head on it. 
Um, so bringing augmented reality into your app can really enhance the user experience. It can allow the user to uh, view uh, and interact with their environment in a completely new way. And there's lots of different examples of this being used. Uh, for example, IKEA is using it to allow their users to place a piece of furniture um, in their home to test whether they like it or not. Uh, Snapchat is using it for like all of their selfie filters. And Pokemon Go is using it to bring Pokemon into our, our world. And so I was really um, excited about the possibilities that this technology holds. And so in coming up with an app, um, I came across this thing called geocaching. So who here has heard of geocaching? Cool. So most of you know, but for those of you who don't, it's basically like an adult scavenger hunt. So someone hides an object at a, at a specific location, they record the latitude and longitude coordinates of that object, and then they post it online for other people to find. And so with my app, I decided to make a virtual geocaching app. So, you, so using augmented reality, um, I basically made the app so that users can drop virtual objects in space for other people to find. So let me show you what I'm talking about with the demo. So upon logging into my app, you'll see your user information at the top. And you'll also see a character, which you can then uh, customize. And then at the bottom of the page, you can see your collection of items. Let's say I want to drop this piece of gold where I'm standing. So I'll drop it. And then I'll go to my dashboard, and I'll see all the items that are near me. So let's say I want to pick up what I just dropped. So I'll enter AR mode. I'll look around for that object. Oh, looks like I have some competition <laughs> for it. <laughs> but, oh, it looks like I got it first. And I get my own firework display out of it. <laughs> so going back to the profile page, I can see that my gold is, is back uh, in my collection. So hopefully I've convinced you guys to get this app once it's on the app store. So here's a list of all the technologies that I used uh, for my project. The top two are the pieces of technology that were totally unfamiliar to me. Uh, I used Vero React. So that was the um, augmented reality component library that I used to make those 3D scenes. And it was a great introduction to augmented reality. Um, I also made this app in React Native. And so this was my first time ever making a mobile app, and it was a lot of fun. Um, for the back end, I made my server with Node, Express, and Postgres. So challenges, um, I first ran into challenges. Uh, first and foremost was capturing the phone's location and orientation data, um, especially in Galvanize's basement. Um, <laughs> but I was able to figure it out. Um, and so, okay, so then my next uh, challenge was configuring my app with Vero. So Vero, it was kind of difficult to bring in um, some, it was incompatible with some third-party libraries that I was trying to bring in. And so um, setting it up and picking the ones that I wanted was, was a challenge. Uh, storing the latitude and longitude coordinates um, for the, the object locations was also a challenge. Uh, the database didn't want to store past three decimal places, which I thought was strange, but um, I was able to do a workaround. Um, and then lastly, just even with all the information I needed, uh, doing the actual mapping calculations was a challenge. All right, so my future plans for this app I plan on bringing an interactive map where the users can actually view the items that are near them um, and be able to enter augmented reality mode once they're within a certain radius. I'd also like to bring in level features. So once you get to a certain level, you'll have access to new items and new features of the game. Um, I'd like to bring in new items. And then I'd also like to bring um, a user interaction component. So like trading items or um, communication between users. So with that, I'd like to close my talk. Again, my name is Ryan Hawley. I'm a full stack software developer here in Denver looking for a job. Um, and below is all my contact information. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Ryan. Next up, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Chris.
Testing, testing. Hello. Hello and welcome. Thanks for coming. My name's Chris Edgar. And today I'd like to present to you my latest project, Game Punk. Now, just a quick question for the audience. Are there any gamers here? Yeah, 90s games in particular, right? Yes. <laughs> well, me too. I've uh, been a gamer since I was eight years old. I love gaming. Uh, some of the earliest games I remember playing are uh, Doom, all the way to Half-Life, with Half-Life being the game that really triggered my uh, love of gaming. Uh, Now, I'm very passionate about gaming. However, I, in, for the most part, do not keep up with the gaming industry in general because sifting through Google can be cumbersome at times. It can be difficult when you got to look up articles from a plethora of different game publishers out there. And I personally would prefer that uh, all gaming news and from all the different publishers was a little bit more easily accessible. And also, most publishers don't provide public API endpoints for developers. Uh, to have easy access to their information. So I had to come up with a solution. Rather than searching through Google or a particular publisher, with GamePunk, you'll be able to view all the latest articles from all your favorite publishers. Sends, the ads, and the clutter, and the live feed, and just all that stuff in general that you see when you visit one of these sites. You'll have all of these in one central location. I'd like to show a little demo of it. Upon entering GamePunk, you'll see a list of the latest articles, starting with the most recently published at the top. Here, you'll be able to continuously scroll down through all of the articles, uh, also while also maintaining the ability to sort by publisher and favorite articles for later viewing. And as a side note, I just want to mention that uh, using this technology to gather this data in order to show these articles was a really fun process, which I'll circle back to uh, later on in the presentation. The tech that I use to design and style my web app are Vue.js and UIKit, respectively. For the server stuff and the database stuff, I use Node.js, Express, Postgres, and Connex. In order to gain the articles from the different publishers, I use the Publiteer for its web scraping capability. While working on this project, I encountered a few challenges, uh, one of which was learning how to use Puppeteer and its ability to scrape the web for the data that was necessary to display those articles that I showed you just now. Uh, once, once I got it down and once that data started coming back, it was actually pretty fun and uh, I really enjoyed it as Puppeteer is a very powerful tool. One of the other challenges that I encountered was learning Vue. Uh, Vue is a, was a completely new technology to me. Uh, 100%, um, and it was mostly the view syntax that I was having issues with with just 10 days uh, to finish this project. Some future plans for GamePunk include uh, adding more publishers to the scraper uh, so that the users may have more options to choose from, and also allowing users to remove publishers from their feed. I'd also like to implement a drag and drop functionality for the articles so that you may just drag an article straight into your favorites. Uh, and last but not least, I'd also like to implement a multiple favorites list for users, so that rather than just having one main feed and a favorites list, they can customize their own feed. Once again, my name is Chris Edgar, and this is Game Punk. Thank you very much for your time.
Okay, uh, my name is Jody, and I'm not really sure how you pronounce my last name. <laughs> and when it comes to dressing, I need all the help I can get. Usually my mom dresses me, and it turns out well because I look like this. <laughs> but she got tired of uh, coming over, picking out my outfit every morning, so I created style. So what is style? I'm glad you asked. Uh, style is basically a virtual closet. It lets you pick your outfit out from your phone and then it keeps an inventory of your clothes. So I'm just gonna walk through a little demo here. So you'll open it up, it'll bring in the high and low for the day, and then based on what you want, or based on how cold it is, so it's cold outside, we'll go to the winter section, it'll display all your articles of clothing. For me, I like to start with my hat. And so you can go through, you can swipe, pick the hat out you want for the day. <laughs> you can change it if you want to. It's like Tinder for your clothes. So if you want to add a new a new item, you hit add new, uh, you go through, you hit upload, and then this will access your camera roll, and you select that. Then you populate your color, and then your description, and then you hit submit. And then once you do this, your deck should refresh. You can go through and pick your new uh, article of clothing. Uh, if you don't like that article of clothing, you can go ahead and delete it, and it'll ask you if you're sure you want to delete. You just press delete, and then once you do that, it'll be gone from your deck. So, and then there's an edit feature. If you have any problems with your clothing, you can just go ahead and uh, go through it, update the, uh, the color, the description, or the, uh, the image. Some of the front end technology that I use uh, was React Native and Native Base. On the back end, I use Node.js, Connects, and Postgres. Some of the challenges that I face uh, <laughs> Expo versus Native Code. So the environments are really different to set up. And um, I have a very unique way of breaking things. So I have to delete my project a couple of times. And then, ironically, styling was a, was a big issue for me. Um, every time that I wanted to do something, uh, it turned out to be the exact opposite of what I wanted. The weather API, it took 24 hours to update. I didn't realize that, so I spent a couple hours trying to debug something that wasn't really wrong. And then passing the data, just navigating through the screens and then passing the pictures back and forth um, was a little bit of a challenge because it was a different method than, that we had used. Some of the future plans that I have, um, I want to integrate with other style apps uh, for my classmates, and then add subcategories so you can search, so like for colors and stuff like that. And then I also want to add like a laundry bin, so that way when you accept the, uh, the outfit, it puts it in your laundry bin, takes it out of the deck, and you know that you need to wash it. And then finally, um, I want to add a feature where I can submit my outfit for review by my mom. <laughs> That way I don't go out looking like this. <laughs> Once again, my name is Joey Misery, and my house is called Sal. So please join me in welcoming to the stage, So. Speaking is so important. Uh, speaking, as we all know, is the quickest way to learn the language, just like how you can uh, ride a bike, or just ride a bike by pedaling your feet in the air and doing balance drills. But at some point, you just have to ride. And learning a language is the same way. You just have to speak. It does not force you to think on your feet, see if you ever mistakes in action, and most importantly, you get to immerse yourself in the language. And as we all know, immersion by learning a foreign language, uh, studying abroad is. Uh, that's kind of it. 
But you can't travel, languages are valid. So the problem is that it is very difficult to find time to practice speaking with a busy schedule. Um, I have used websites like italki.com and Hello Talk to find native speakers. But the problem with that method is often unreliable and time consuming. Um, so the problem, uh, first you have to find a language partner, exchange messages, and then schedule a time to practice. But most of the time, somebody cancels because things come up, happens. Which is why consistency becomes a major issue. So with language, learners will be able to instantly connect with language learners, um, so you can practice anytime, anywhere, no need for scheduling, and most importantly, you can stay consistent. Let's see how that works with a demo. You can get started to log in. You can also sign up. On the dashboard, you can select the language that you are learning, as well as the language that you speak, and the channel you want to post it to, and we create a live course. We can wait for someone to join us or join others for an instant session, and we can connect with someone. Here we can practice speaking live, as well as use the text box to write. To uh, <laughs> show it to That's what Smurfs did. <laughs> that is the core functionality of English. For my technology stack, I chose to use React and Material UI for the front end. For the back end, I use WebRTC with Python. That's my familiar and notion technology. Uh, WebRTC is about to Connect to different browsers for video chat, and use Python to uh, match users up based on their language preferences. Uh, Node.js, Postgres for my database, with Linux, and I deployed the project right now. Some of the challenges that I faced uh, were, of course, connecting to different browsers, making sure that the video popped up when somebody connected, as well as the uh, text messages. Um, also, learning and fully implementing Python. Python to match up users. I look forward to uh, completing that in the future. For my future plans, I want to be able to add features like the ability to edit each other's grammar in the text box and highlight mistakes, uh, in chat area to make the learning process more fun, and the ability to have friends and stay connected with people you have practice with, as well as the option to join group chats. That is language. I hope this will help you guys uh, achieve your language learning goals. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. All right, let's give another big hand for our first group of presenters. <laughs> Take about seven to ten minute break, grab another drink, grab some more food, use the restroom. I do want to mention that our next presentation, uh, what? Five minutes? Five minutes? Maybe about five minutes. Our next presentation is actually fully deployed on the Apple App Store. We have some QR codes hanging out around the United States. Uh, if you if you would like, there's someone with a live component to the presentation. You do not have to, but if you'd like to participate and see the app working on your phone, you can search for subtone on the iOS app store. See you in a bit.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, please start making your way back to your seats. We're going to get our next and final round of presentations going in two to three minutes. Two to three minute warning. Oh, and please, if you're curious, our next presentation app is live on the App Store. You got to download it for free. Seats so we can get this second round started. show you all on the screen. Now before I tell you about my app, I have to tell you a little bit about myself so you understand exactly why I'm all this. I've been a DJ here in Denver for the past 14 years, and about three years into it, I realized that the market's just completely saturated. How many of you know a DJ? Yeah. Exactly. So I started teaching myself to make music, and in that time, I've come across a lot of problems. 
By the way, you can find all my music on your plate payments in Spotify. Now that problem, the problem is terrible music. Now we've all heard, and we've all cringed at hearing. Check my SoundCloud, bro. It, it can be even worse when it's one of your friends. Now here's one of my friends to show you exactly what I mean. Subtone converts the circular face for music theory, which can be very complicated and take years to understand, into something as basic as the color wheel, which hopefully we all learn in kindergarten. Now that sounds great, but how does it work? Now this is the part where if you did download the app, go ahead and start the app so you can follow along with the demo. Now upon starting the app, it automatically starts making the frequency of the sound that you input the answer. And you can tell by staying on the same side of the color wheel here that your song is still in key. I know the song is in key because I know it. <laughs> now, if you ever forget the keys, it does have a color key there on the right. And if you ever want to lock the music, you just press the lock button. We'll put the title in there. The title of this song is actually Slide by Inflated Pigments. Some shameless self promotion there. <laughs> and the key it's in is G. My initials are ESA. And then upon pushing enter on this, it takes you to the sample screen. And you can see there that it's actually populated on the bottom of the screen. Going back to the main page, you can continue your tune. And that's the basics of the app. So let's check back in with my friend. Now, I can play like this. <laughs> So I built this app using React Native for the front end. I also use Native Base for a lot of the stuff. GitHub saved me being able to save my work. React Native Audio Toolkit I used to get the frequency of each note and Realm for the actual data on the back end. Some of the challenges I had with this app was React Native. I've actually, believe it or not, never made an app before. This is my first. And in that, I learned that there's no canvas element in React Native. So creating any sort of animation across the screen proved to be extremely difficult. Also, mapping all the frequencies took quite a bit of time. But believe it or not, the free version that you all have right now, I actually created that in four days, and then spent the other five days trying to publish it to the app store. <laughs> <laughs> so future plans I have for this app would be a paid version, because we all like money, right? <laughs> also, some educational elements such as chord progressions and key suggestions. So when you push a key, other keys light up to tell you what would go good with that tone. Also, of course, an Android version. Does that sound good? My name is Evan Alpaca. Thank you all for listening. Um, unfortunately, to all recruiters and audience, I am taking. I start my new career next week. I love it. Please check up. Oh, sorry. Choked up with. Um, <laughs> check out my code on GitHub. Download my app subtone, and please check my SoundCloud, bro. <laughs> Next up, please join me in welcoming to the stage, Carrie!
Abernathy. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about my mobile app, Travella. I just want to start out by asking who in the audience likes to travel? Yeah. And who of the people that like to travel have good journal documentation or entries or scrapbooking of that travel? Yeah. Ask? Okay. Um, so that is where Travella comes in handy. First, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am a full stack developer here at Galvanize, and this is a photo of Charlie on the right, who has been our mascot for the past six months. He's been here every single day of class that I have been here. Um, and then starting on the photo on the left, that is my beautiful mother who's in the audience. And, um, and she's from Taiwan, um, and so for my first trip ever out of Florida, uh, I was about 13, and she took me on a trip to Taiwan. So. 20-hour plane ride, and a few weeks later, my whole life was changed. My perspective was changed, and my love for travel started to grow every day. Um, these are just a few of the pictures that I've been for the places in the past few years. And the reason that I made Travella is because it's an amazing way to save memories while you travel. Um, you can upload pictures and start to create your journal entries while you're in the moment so that it's not a task afterwards. Um, and uploading these straight from your phone is going to be effortless. And this is just a structure of my app going from a paper journal that takes a bunch of time and might waste a bunch of uh, paper and energy and going to a place where you have your lips, uh, your list of travel places that you've been and your journal entries that goes straight to um, a mapping feature that I've implemented. And here's a little demo. So this is the front of the app. You can either sign up as a new user, um, where you can go and as soon as you click it, you can make a new trip for any of the places that you've been. And if you're not a new user, you will go up to the sign-in button, where you will go to the profile that you've already created for yourself. And it will have a list of places that you've been and the dates that you've been. If you click on them, you can see that you can make different journal entries and collages. The backgrounds can change. You can add text or photos or pictures. Um, and then once you're in that, you can add descriptions to each picture or page. And when you click on the title of the entry that you've been, it'll take you to a map of the centralized location so you can see sort of the area that you've covered. For my front end technology, I used uh, React Native, Google Maps, and React Native Base. And for my back end, I used ConnectJS, Express, Heroku, and Node.js. Some of the challenges um, that I faced were using React Native. Um, this was my first mobile app ever. And um, using a brand new technology in 10 days was unlike any challenge I've ever come across before. Um, I really had to focus on time management as well as teaching myself to push through the stress. Um, and a few ways that I did that was just like by walking away when things get too much um, or pivoting when you really can't figure something out. And I've also learned from being here long enough to ask for help when you need it. Um, and now that it's over, I can say that the challenge of this uh, was very fun and very intense and very rewarding. Now my future implementations, um, I want to share with family and friends. I want to make this sort of a social network. Um, the main reason for that is that my mom and I are always arguing over who's going to send who pictures back and forth from each trip, and most of the time it doesn't happen. So with this um, feature, you'd be able to add uh, to your friends or family's albums with any pictures you might have. I'd also like to create um, a chat option so you can talk to people who might have been to that location before and uh, have some ideas of things that you could do or people, or people who have not yet been but want to go, and especially if this becomes a social um, application, you can talk to your family and friends and maybe plan a trip together if you're wanting to go to the same place. 
And I also would like to do um, more layout options for the journal entries, just so you have complete uh, freedom over the way that you lay things out. And again, my name is Carrie Abernathy. Um, these are my contact information. And I'd like everyone to think about what trip you're gonna use next so that you can use Travella. Thank you. You can also compare data to other drivers who would drive the same vehicle as you and see if you're spending too much money or if you're doing pretty good. And here's how Easy Driver works. So on the user screen, you just log in, username and password will take you to the home screen. When you get to the home screen, you see your profile, you see your payment, insurance, registration, how much those are, and when those are due. You have your next maintenance, which is tracking the progress, and you see you got about 1,200 miles before you need to go to your next maintenance. You have your current mileage underneath it, and underneath that you can actually schedule your next maintenance by pushing that button, it sends you right to the phone number, and sends you right there so you can sign, uh, go to your next maintenance. You're going to go to the gas screen. When we get to the gas screen, we're going to add a fuel receipt. So you can add your fuel receipt, you can see the date, the miles, the costs, and the gallons. And when you submit that, you're going to see that your most current receipt is right there in the middle with the history of the other ones underneath it. At the top, you can see it tracks your current miles per gallon. We're going to go back to the home screen and go to the maintenance screen next. And on the maintenance screen, you can see you're tracking these different maintenances. You can add a new maintenance that you'd like to track at any time. These are tracking it by the mileage, so you can kind of see how far you are and where they are. Underneath that, you can see your last maintenance and the date it was, how much it costed, your next maintenance, how far away you are from it, and how much that's going to cost you. Our last screen is going to be our data screen. You can actually see how much you spent totally on your car, what percentage of those came from where, and actually visualize it on the pie graph. And underneath that, you can see your average dollars per mile. So you can see you're doing pretty well at 1.9, and someone's spending all the way to $6 per mile. My future plans, I'd like to be able to use Easy Drive and go car shopping. You know, you might think you might be able to work, uh, buy a new Mercedes or use Mercedes at $10,000, which you need to use to show you that maintenance might make that affordable. Two other things I'd like to do with image recognition, I'd like to be able to take a picture of a check light on your, on your speed up speedometer and see what those descriptions might mean to you, um, as well as take a picture at the gas pump and have it automatically input uh, yeah, how much you spent in the gallons. The technologies I use, I use React Native for the front end, as well as SVG chart, 
uh, library. For the back end, I use Node.js, Postgres, and Connects, and deploy it with Heroku. Going into this project, I knew I wanted to use a native environment. I've worked a lot with React, so I decided to use React Native, thinking they'd be similar. Even though there are a couple similarities, there's a lot of differences. A couple of the main problems I had were setting up my environment and importing outside libraries, but all, all of their challenges, it was very rewarding. Thank you, everybody. My name is Jonathan, and this was Easy Drive. So before I tell you about your, my app, I want to tell you a little bit about me. I'm uh, super passionate about fashion and it's the industry I want to enter after graduating. I love expressing myself through clothing and finding ways to reduce fashion waste um, because it's a big problem in our world. Second to the oil industry, the fashion and textile industries are the second largest polluters in the world. So they have a lot to figure out. But as a consumer, I'm going to try my best to be a you know a thoughtful consumer and shop responsibly. So I do this through thrifting. You got any thrifters in the club? Yeah. Nice. So thrifting is super fun for me because it's a great way to express myself. Um, there are some really unique items out there, and it also reduces waste. <clears throat> you also save those dollars. Yeah. Right. So I wanted to look super fly for you all today, but I also wanted to do that on a budget. So everything you see on me today is thrifted, minus my shirt and my tie, and I had to have it tailored because it was a little baggy when I put it on, but all of that costs under a hundred bucks, which is a fraction of the retail price it costs to buy a sports blazer. Sports blazer. So there are some problems with thrifting. You take things off the rack and you expect to look like this, but sometimes you look like this. <laughs> and so, you're really excited about your rack? I think it'll do for this That's where a tailor, tailor would come in handy. But there are also issues with this as well. We're really busy people, and sometimes tailoring isn't at the top of our priority list. Um, and so you end up with a pile of clothing in the corner of your room that looks like this. And I wanted to tackle that problem with uniform. So let's go back to the thrift store where I first tried on this outfit and use uniform. So upon signing up, you'll be asked to enter in your measurements. It'll spit out a profile page with you and register your location. And then you make a request form. Choose a tailor in your area. Choose the type of alteration you'd like to have made, in this case, a blazer. Upload a photo of said article of clothing. There it is. And describe what you'd like altered. In this case, the chest and the waist were a bit baggy, so I wanted to bring that in a little bit. Set your pickup drop off date and submit. Make sure everything's good before you send it to the tailor. And voila, you got an appointment with your tailor and the corner of your room is just thanking you because it's not happy with this look at. <laughs> so for uniform, I use these technologies in the front end, Native, Native Base, and Expo. On the back end, I use Connects, Node.js, Postgres, Express, and deployed with Heroku. 
But I did come along with some challenges. Um, View Native was something I was totally unfamiliar with prior to starting this project. And it's fairly new. So these features that I wanted to implement in my app were a challenge to overcome, but got by with a little help from my friends. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm not sure it's my friends. <laughs> For future implementations, I'd love to have a chat box feature so you can talk more directly with your tailor about fittings and any type of problems that might arise in the tailoring experience and a mood board with tailoring ideas for those of us who want a little inspiration on how you want your clothing to fit. So that was Uniform. Again, my name is Daniel Thunlap. Here's my contact information. And I want to thank you all so much for coming. Yeah, for So what is it? So I'm going to ask you, like, think of a time that you went to your friend's house or you went to a party, something like that, social gathering, and they're playing music and you don't, you want to, like, play your own music or, so you want to play your own music and somebody else is in charge, so you're like, oh, can't do anything about that, so. And also they're playing music that you don't really <laughs> like. So this is where TuneSync comes in play. So what it is, is a social playlist. Uh, everybody on their phone has it. And what you do is you join or create a party. Uh, you add your favorite song to the playlist songs. And then you, uh, your friends can also add to that same playlist. And then here's a how it works. So somebody will sign in, or you will sign into your app. Uh, there's a option to create a party. You can call whatever you want and make invitation only, private. Also, there's uh, joint parties that exist already. So we're gonna join vodka tasting party, and we're gonna click on that one uh, request. And then it's going to go to the music. So we search for music here. Uh, I type Ice Ice, and it's going to pull data from Spotify's API. Uh, and I want to play Ice Ice Baby. So I'm going to click on it, and then it's going to add to the playlist. Now, it's the last one because I just added that, but there's already two songs in there added from other users. And right now, that song is playing, uh, the, first, the first song is playing, Michael Jackson. Uh, technology that I use for this uh, app is Vue-Native, uh, Expo, and React Native for the front end and back end. I use uh, Node.js and Connects and uh, Postgres QL. Challenges were Vue-Native. That was my unfamiliar technology. I never used it, and I've done uh, React Native, but it's not. It's nothing similar, so it was hard. <laughs> and also, <clears throat> I didn't make my own music player, but I did spend like two days uh, finding one. <laughs> That's a lot of time. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so future implementations for this, I want to be able to cast to your Google Home speaker or Ale Alexa. Also, use SoundCloud and Google Play Music, not just Spotify. And then also, if you guys remember the, play the, the playlist, so <clears throat> the third song here, for example, if I like that, 
uh, I can hit like, and it's going to move up on the, on the playlist, and it's going to play sooner. Uh, so that's, I didn't have enough time to do that, but that's on the list. Uh, and that's ToonSync, where everybody's a DJ, basically. So, uh, here's my information, so yeah. sign up or log in here. So we're going to go ahead and just log in. And that way it will bring us to our profile page where it'll have your name and all the trips that you've already planned out here. So we're going to go ahead and add a trip called camping. And then we're going to go into the page where we select all the items that we don't want to forget to bring along with us here. So it's camping, so we'll probably need a tent, maybe a sleep bag, a stove, and of course probably some fuel for that. But there is an item on there that is not on the list, so I'm actually going to create it and add it to the list. And uh, it is important that we actually get all the right angles on this, so all of the pictures are imported correctly for this as well. So it's scanning here, now it's processing, and hey, now it actually knows what the axe is there. So let's go ahead and add that back into our camping trip here. So we've added it, now let's go and inspect the campaign here, and it looks like everything's there. So now we're gonna actually start looking everything over, we're ready to go. So it goes, all right, I see your tent, I see this, I see this, I'm ready to go. And there's the ax, and it tells you, hey, you're ready to go. So yeah. that is Packer in a nutshell there. The technologies that I use on the front end are React, Semantic UI for some styling, I use React Router to help go from page to page there. I also deployed on Surge. For my server-side technologies, I use Heroku, uh, Node.js, Express, and Connects, and Postgres with my database. For the new technology that I learned in 10 days, I tackled uh, Google's machine learning framework, TensorFlow.js. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, some challenges, of course, machine learning. Uh, I had to relearn some of the calculus that I had forgotten, um, but I also had to uh, learn about machine learning. Uh, it's very important how you actually teach the app what the items are. You have to make sure that they're in the correct format, so it's almost like it's te teaching a child. You have to say, all right, this is how this is, and you have to repeat it over and over again so that they actually know what's going on. Um, and then also, which technique to use. There's many different machine learning techniques. Uh, one of them you might have seen on Snapchat, where it applies the filter to your face. That's called feature recognition, so it will actually see your face and then apply the filter to the top of that. But the one that I chose was called image classification, so it actually knows which images that it's looking at there. So what I plan on doing in the future 
is improving the accuracy of my app by getting more images in and uh, just making it know your items better as well. And then getting more, a more variety of items. So I'm hoping to go into early testing here soon. So if you'd like to help out, come talk to me afterwards. And again, my name is Kyle Tchaikowski. I am a software engineer, and like almost everybody else, I'm for hire. I appreciate you guys all hanging out. And uh, with Packer, I hope you'll never forget to bring along any of your items or your apps. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank <laughs> you. 